Well, hey, praise the Lord, I'm Pastor Michael Jakes, and welcome once again to the Line by Line podcast, also known as the Monday Night Bible Study, once again coming to you uh, with the Bible study for your soul. We pray that all is well with you once again as we come to you opening up the Word of God. Amen. We are streaming right now live over Facebook, YouTube, and Spreaker.com. Amen. Tonight we are going to continue in our study of the book of Matthew, and we're going through the book one verse at a time. Amen. And remember how we do it here on the Line by Line podcast. We're going through the books of the New Testament in the order that they were written. Not the order that you see traditionally in your Bibles. We're going in the order that they were written and we have reached the book of Matthew. We have much, much to go. So join us tonight as we open up chapter number five in the book of Matthew, a very interesting chapter indeed as we get underway, amen? And we're going to do that as soon as we get back. Well, praise the Lord, we're back. Just to remind you, if you are watching right now over Facebook, uh, that you could help the cause of the gospel uh, simply by sharing this page out, that others also may be blessed uh, by the word of God. That's how we do it here. We want to make sure, we want to ensure that as many people as possible are able to hear the life-changing message of the word of God. Amen. So tonight, as we said, we are going to go right into the book of Matthew, chapter uh, number five. Amen. But let's first open up in a word of prayer. Lord, we bless your name once again for giving us this opportunity uh, to open up your word. Lord, it is not something that we take lightly. So, Lord, we bless your name and we thank you, Lord, for all that you have done and for all that you are doing. Lord, we pray for the next few minutes, Lord, that you might give us clarity of mind and heart. Lord, I pray that you might draw those who need to hear these precious words uh, from your Bible uh, to this place on the World Wide Web. Lord, have your way. Bless us together even right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God is good. As we always say, God is good all the time. Amen. We just bless him. God bless you, Kathleen. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Well, let's open up to Matthew chapter number five. Matthew chapter number five. And Matthew chapter number five opens up uh, with what we traditionally call the Beatitudes, the Beatitudes, and it's a Latin word, uh, the Beatitudes, it's a Latin word that simply means uh, bliss or happiness, because we see there are about 11 or 12 different blesseds, and so that phrase, that phrase, uh, blessed, that goes through these first, uh, first uh, several verses in this book, uh, talk about the fact that we are happy or blessed when we do these things that we are going to speak about uh, from uh, these Beatitudes, amen? And so these are powerful, they are practical, and they are principles that God expects his people to live by. The entire Sermon on the Mount, this is just the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, 6, and 7. Uh, it's the Sermon on the Mount, known traditionally as that. God bless you, Francis. Um, but these... Words that we read here, uh, as lofty as they are, uh, they can only be attained. We can only live out these principles as our faith is rightly placed. You can't just pick up and say, listen, I'm going to live this way. I'm, I'm going to follow the Beatitudes. I'm going to base my life on the Sermon on the Mount and everything's going to be all right. No, no, that's not that's not how we do it. These words spoken by Christ were meant to be lived by his people, by his people who have his spirit. And once again, the only way 
that we can live out these words, these principles, is to have our faith in the finished work of Christ. Amen. He gives us the victory. He gives us the ability. And as we do so, his Holy Spirit obviously will help us to live out these words. Now, not to perfection, because once again, we will never reach perfection in this life. But what we do have is scripture that tells us that sin shall not have dominion over us. So, as we read, uh, just keep in mind uh, that once again, these principles, these principles that we're going to read about here in these next several chapters, they are not the way of salvation. They are not the way to salvation, but rather they are the way in salvation. I don't mean the way into salvation, but once we are in Christ, these are the principles and precepts uh, that the Lord would have us to live by. Amen. So let's go into chapter number five. Let's start in verse number one. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. So we don't know what mountain it was. It, it's, it doesn't say, and it's not really that important what mountain that he was sitting on. He wasn't at the top of the mountain. It was probably a smaller hill. Uh, but here he is. He comes and, and listen, we see his humanity. Humanity In these first two, vo- two verses, we see the, the humanity of Christ. That he comes, he walks, he sees the mountain, he sees the people. He takes a seat and his disciples, not all 12 because all 12 were not formed yet. But he had many followers at the beginning of his ministry. And so these disciples come and verse number two, he opened his mouth and he opened his mouth and taught them and taught them, and no one uh, ever taught like Christ. Uh, We read this from the book of Luke, chapter number four. After he had finished uh, speaking, the people said, no one has ever spoken like this before, and this is true. No one had ever spoken like this, and the things that he was about to say, because of who he was, he was qualified to say these things, amen? Let's start here, verse number three. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, who are those who are poor in spirit? Those who are poor in spirit are simply those who recognize their need. They recognize their need of the Lord. You and I are poor in spirit. We were poor in spirit, and we continue to be poor in spirit in the sense in the sense that we recognize that we need the Lord. Every day, every hour, I need Christ. I have to fall back on him. I have to rely on him. So in that sense, we are poor in spirit. No, yes, we are rich. Scripture tells us that we are rich in all the blessings that we have from him. That is absolutely true. But once again, when it comes to who we are and our need of him, we must remain poor in spirit, okay, and and, and we're going to get these next three or four verses uh, uh, should all be taken together as they are, because they are pointing out something very important that we're going to get to in just a couple of minutes, so blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, we are citizens of heaven, as we speak, we are citizens of heaven, Our, our, our ticket has been punched, our place has been set, uh, We are going to heaven, amen? So we just bless the Lord for that. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven because we are poor in spirit. Verse number four, blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. Now, very much like being poor in spirit, those who mourn are simply those who are saddened and those who are grieved by their own sin. How does your own sin affect you? Your own sin, God bless you, Donna, God bless you. How does your own sin affect you? Do you allow sin to run rampant in your life? When you do sin, and I say when, I don't want to know what you do or anything, but when you do sin, uh, does it have an adverse effect on you? Are you grieved? Are you saddened? Do you immediately run to the throne of grace to receive mercy? And that's what this is talking about. Those who mourn, for they shall be 
comforted, when I'm grieved, when I'm saddened by my own sin, I shall find comfort. Where's that comfort coming from? From the throne of grace. Because when I ask the Lord to cleanse me and wash me of my sin, he graciously comforts me by forgiving me and washing my sins away. Don't fall for the lie that uh, is spreading. And we've talked about it many times. Don't fall for the lie that says that God's people uh, do not need to confess their sins anymore. No, you as a child of God need to confess your sins. You will not get a sin consciousness and you do not affect, or you do not rather offend God when you come to him asking for forgiveness, okay? Ask the Lord to forgive you of your sin when you sin. Blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. comforted. Verse number five, blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. They shall inherit the earth. <clears throat> now, when he's talking about meek here, who are the meek? The meek are those who are simply submissive and humble. Submissive and humble. Those are the meek. So we are blessed when we retain an attitude of humility as we serve the Lord, you want to stay clear of pride. Oh my, you want to steer clear of pride because God resists the proud. Matthew chapter four, verse number six, God resists the proud. There's something about pride that sets the Lord back, that moves him away, that repels him. And this is probably because that it was pride Pride was the very first sin uh, that was detected in the universe. Let me put it that way. Uh, the very uh, first sin, uh, Satan in all of his glory, or rather Lucifer in all of his glory. Uh, we see in the book of Ezekiel that he was beautiful. He was beautiful to look at, but because of his beauty, we read in Isaiah chapter number 14 uh, that he wanted to be God. He wanted not to be like God. He wanted to be God himself. He says, I will be like the most high. Trust me. He didn't want God to, he didn't want to be co, a co-God. He wanted to be God himself. And it was all because of pride. Pride brought him down. So God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And that's what's meant here in verse number five of Matthew five. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, notice the tense here from verse number three. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay. We are currently citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Once again, kingdom of heaven is unique to Matthew. In the other gospels, uh, they call the same kingdom of heaven. They call it the kingdom of God. They are one uh, and the same. We are currently uh, citizens of the kingdom of heaven because we are of the kingdom of God. But in verse number five, it says, those who are meek shall inherit, shall inherit the earth. And that is, and that speaks of uh, the coming kingdom age. We shall be there. The coming kingdom age is the millennium, the the, the 1,000 year reign of Christ after uh, the great tribulation. But once again, that's another story. That's in another book. But that's what it's speaking of here. Amen. So that's very, very important to remember. God bless you, Ross Verlaine. God bless you. Verse number six, verse number six, Matthew chapter number five and verse number six. It says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. Now, as I read this, this particular verse set just about right in the middle of all of the Beatitudes, this is the nucleus. This, I believe, is the nucleus of the Beatitudes because it's talking about the fact that you are blessed when you hunger and you thirst after 
righteousness. Now, what does it mean to hunger and thirst after righteousness? We have to go back and remember what is the ultimate goal of the Christian life. The ultimate goal of the Christian life is to be like Jesus. That's our goal. We want to be like him. Uh, we read from uh, the book of Philippians chapter number three. Let's start in verse number eight. Philippians three, starting in verse eight. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Now listen to nine and 10. And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings made, being made conformable unto his death. And that's all talking about Paul's goals, what he desired more than anything, is to be conformable unto his death. It's to be like Christ, like him. That's the goal of the Christian life. And when we find ourselves hungering and thirsting after, whose righteousness? Not my own. After the righteousness that we just spoke about here in verse number nine, when we find ourselves hungering after his righteousness that is through faith in Christ, then... We are on the road to being like Christ. That's what's happening here. So in verse number six, we are blessed. We will find supreme happiness, fulfillment when we are hungering and thirsting after this righteousness. Uh, we read from uh, from the psalmist in, in Psalm 42. Let me get there real quick. Uh, Psalm uh, 42 and verse number one, one of my favorite one of my favorite psalms, uh, and David speaks, uh, rather the psalmist, it's not necessarily David, but here's what it says. As the heart of the deer panteth after the water brook, so my soul, at, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. What is he saying? Lord, I just want you. I just want you. I want more of you. That's all I want in my life. Just more of you, less of me. That is the Christ life. That is the Christ life. The old song says, more of you, more of you. I've had all, but what I need is more of you. Of things, I've had my fill. And yet I hunger still, empty and bare. Lord, hear my prayer for more of you. That should be the prayer of every child of God. Lord, make me more like you. That's the goal of the Christian life. And when we begin to live this way, we shall be filled. He will give us his righteousness. Once again, not our own righteousness. This, this type of righteousness comes by and through faith and Christ and his finished work. That's the kind of righteousness that causes us to become more like him. More like him. Verse number seven. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. God bless you, Tonda. God bless you. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, there's not much explaining that needs to be done here. If you are merciful, then you should expect mercy. Okay? Blessed are the merciful. Those who show compassion and mercy on others can or will also be shown compassion and obtain mercy. Amen. Verse number eight. Verse number eight. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, once again, those who are pure in heart are those who have obtained authentic righteousness. I'm going to call it authentic righteousness, true, authentic righteousness. Once again, I don't mind being redundant here. True, authentic righteousness is that, is that righteousness that is found when we place our faith in Christ and his finished work. 
And once again, you've probably seen the uh, you've probably seen uh, uh, the stickers on the back of cars uh, over the years that says that Christ is that God's not finished with me yet. And that is a true statement. God is not finished with any one of us yet. But yet and still, we have been clothed with his righteousness, not our own. And because we are still in this moral shell and we still have the clinging vines of the fall on us, we will never see perfection in this life. But not to worry. Once again, we have his righteousness and we ought not to allow sin to dominate us. Sin shall not have dominion over us. So blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Amen. Now that I mean, when, when you think about it, uh, when you think about seeing God, beholding him. Oh, that song just come to my spirit just now. We shall behold him face to face in all of his glory. Amen. One day we are going to see him face to face in all the sin and all the all the things in this life that cling to us and all the things that uh, frustrate us. All of these things are going to drop off of us the moment that we become like him. When he takes us up uh, into the sky uh, at the rapture, the Bible says that we shall be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. At that very moment when we see him, we shall be like him him. Praise the Lord. We are going to be just like him. I'm in verse number nine, Matthew chapter five and verse number nine. It says, blessed, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. Now, who are the peacemakers? Who are the peacemakers? The peacemakers are those who have made their peace with God. The Bible says in the book of Romans, I believe it's Romans chapter 5, that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. Now, it's one thing to have peace with God, but along with the peace with God, we also have been given the peace of God, the peace of God. And you can only get the peace of God when you have already obtained peace with God. And here, a peacemaker is one who has found peace with God. And now what happens? Now it comes full circle. Those who have made their peace with God are now able to become peacemakers. How? By bringing the message of the gospel to those who have never heard it. By bringing the gospel to those who need to hear it. And they become part of the ministry of reconciliation, drawing men to be at peace with God. Amen. It also, of course, means uh, talking about becoming a peacemaker. It also uh, is speaking about the fact that we we now have a certain uh, camaraderie. Uh, we need to conti continue to have a certain camaraderie with those who are around us. We must not be people of war. In other words, we must not uh, constantly be trying to have our own way and do our own thing. Uh, we must Live out this life a certain way in front of the world. The world, ladies and gentlemen, the world is watching us. They are watching you and they are watching me. They are not just watching, they are listening to every single thing that we say. And they're looking, the world is looking to find fault in us. And by so doing, they find fault in Christ. There is no fault in him. There is no fault in Christ. But when we slip up, when we don't do the right thing, uh, when we suffer for doing wrong, when it's a wrong that we have done, then the world will seize upon that opportunity and try to come at us. And so once again, we must live in front of the world properly. We have Christ in us, and we must show forth Christ. Now, I know this is not something that is simple. This is not something that is simple. As we live in this world, we have to we have to go and do and be, and we have to be a part of things, and we have to go places, and all of these different things. There's school, there's work, there's home, there's job, there's home, all these things, and we still must continue to have the life and mind of Christ through it all. But he gives us his spirit. 
And once again, as we keep our faith planted in the finished work, we'll begin to see change that will come forth uh, in our lives. I'm a, I want to go to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter number 5, where it, where it begins to talk about uh, this great ministry of reconciliation that we were just talking about. Let me start at verse number 18. And all things are of God. Matthew uh, 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself. When that happens, listen, that means that we have now been uh, brought into his peace. We now have his peace when we are reconciled with him by Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So now because we have been reconciled to him and we have peace, now he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. If you don't know what you should do, if you are somehow waiting on the Lord to show you where you fit in in the ministry, and I've had this question throughout uh, throughout my teaching time over the years. I don't know where I belong. I don't know what God's will for my life is. You have been by default. By default, you are a part of the ministry of reconciliation. And so as you wait on the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do? And he will plant you. He will show you uh, what you what he wants you to do. But in the meantime, you are a member, a part of the ministry of reconciliation. Verse number 19, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. He has not left you alone. He has shown you what to do. You are part of the ministry of reconciliation, and he has given you the word of reconciliation. What is the word of reconciliation? That Jesus saves, that Jesus loves. Your own testimony is part of that word of reconciliation, but it is through the word of God that people are going to come to the Lord. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Yes, you are part of the ministry of reconciliation because you have been brought into peace. You are at peace with God. Verse number 20. And then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in God's stead, in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. That's your ministry. That's your ministry. Tell people, implore people to be reconciled to God. Listen, we are an extension of the ministry of Christ. Let me put it this way. We are an extension of the earthly ministry of Christ. That's what we do. That's what we do. Jesus' last words on this, on this earth was, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Not take over the world for Christ, but go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Teaching them, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Those were his, those were his parting words to us. And we can only do that because we have been brought to peace. We are peacemakers. Amen? We are peacemakers. Now, going into this a little bit more, let me go to Luke. Chapter number four and verse number 18. Once again, if you're wondering what your ministry, what should you be about? I don't know where I fit in. Luke chapter number four, verse number 18. Jesus' own words concerning himself. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. That was the sum total of Christ's earthly ministry. And we are Christ, we are extensions of that ministry. Jesus said, Jesus said, and we're going to get into this in just a few verses, but I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. Jesus said, as long as he is in the world, he is the light of the world. 
So Christ in his human physical body has exited. He is not here physically. We know his presence is here. His spirit is here. Spirit, his spirit dwells in us. We know that. But he is not physically here. He said as long as he was here physically, he would be the light of the world. In his physical and I mean completely physical, in his physical absence, we are extensions of his earthly ministry. We are the lights of the world. We are to shine his light and not our own. And that's so very important to remember. We're going to come back to those verses in just a few minutes. But let me go uh, to continue in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 10. Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When is the last time that you have been persecuted? Have you ever been persecuted? Now, we sort of in our mind, at least in my mind, when I hear the word persecution, I think of bad treatment. Uh, I think of burning at the stake. I think of being thrown in prison. When I think of persecution, that's those are the thoughts that are conjured in my mind. And it's not completely wrong, but the word persecute here means to pursue, to cause someone to run, to put someone to flight. That's what the word persecute here means. And so have you ever, has Satan ever pursued you? And I know you and I have been pursued. Satan is out for us. The Bible says that he walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Oh yes, we we have been pursued uh, by the enemy. And the enemy uses individuals to pursue us, to track us down. Now the purpose of the tracking down is to treat us poorly. That's the purpose of the tracking down. That's the purpose of putting them to flight. It's putting fear in their heart, calling them to run, catching them, and treating them badly. That's the whole idea behind persecution. And so he said so. He says though, blessed. We are blessed when we are persecuted for righteousness sake. You see, I believe there's a special blessing that comes to those who realize that how they are and who they are is going to offend someone. If you, something I've said for years, if you live this Christian life the way Jesus lived his life, and I know that's a far stretch, we are not little Jesuses, but if you live this life as Christ did, you are going to have enemies. Everybody is not going to be loving you and putting their arm around you and say, oh, he's a great guy, oh, she's a great woman. That's not going to be what's going to happen if you live according to this word. Blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Are you willing to step out and be righteous, even if it means being persecuted, being pursued, being chased down, do you still desire to be like him? And that's what this is all about. I want to be like him. But you're blessed when you go about being like him and you are treated badly for it. You are blessed. Blessed. Happy. Why? Because you know that you are doing, you are living right. You know you're living right when the world looks at you and says, I hate you. I don't appreciate you. Uh, what you're doing is wrong. When the world says that about you concerning the things and how you live or your own standards and principles or what you've spoken, the world looks at us and, and says that the things that we say about certain subjects, we're, 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 we're called bad people. Hate speech, if we say, uh, if we talk something bad about uh, the LGBTQ community or anything like that, we're, we're told that it's hate speech. No, no, no. It's love speech. It's love speech. We tell people what God says on a certain subject, on a certain situation. Now, it's one thing if the world does not want to 
spirit. And once again, there you have it. Persecuted for the sake of righteousness. We are blessed. Verse number 11. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. There you have it. Falsely. For my sake. And those, those are that, that phrase at the end. When they say these things falsely for the sake of Christ. On account of Christ. Calling us. Uh, calling, calling what we say hate speech. That's false speech. We say what we say on account of what Christ has spoken. And he says here, we're blessed when men uh, revile us. In other words, mock us and insult us. We're blessed. Listen, no one likes to be called out of their name. Who appreciates that? No one, no one loves to be called out of their name. But if you name the name of Jesus and you stand upon the word of God, you can count on you having someone call you out of your name at some point. Listen, I've, I've, we've done street ministry. I've done street ministry over the years. And listen, I've had things thrown at me. I've had eggs and all sorts of fruits thrown at me in my direction. I've been hit a couple of times with some eggs. <laughs> uh, all because, once again, it was the message. It was the message of the gospel. It sometimes infuriates. It sometimes causes people to go into an uproar because the words stick and the words sting. And But we must expect that type of response when we stand up for Christ. Trust me. And we, when, when, I was, when I was doing street, when I was doing street work several years back, uh, it, things were not as bad as they have gotten over these years. Now, things are very bad. And people still do street preaching. Uh, I can't remember the last time I was, the last time I was outside in the street, give, uh, a few years ago, a couple of years ago. Uh, but the point is, the point is that men and women, for the most part, they're hungry. They don't know that it's Christ that they need. And when they hear it, sometimes the gospel from the first time, it sounds offensive. Because the gospel is going to point out sin. It calls people a sinner. But it's the truth. It's the truth. Amen. So you're blessed when people revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil things against you falsely on account of Christ. Rejoice, verse number 12, and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. I want to look at this verse number 12. Rejoice. What does that word rejoice mean? I looked up that word rejoice, and it means uh, to be conscious of and delight in the grace of God. That word rejoice. It's a root word. It's from the root word of uh, uh, charis, which means grace. And it's actually the word chiro. Um, and it means, uh, to be conscious of and delight in the grace of God, rejoice, rejoice and be exceeding over the top, exalt over the top joy when this kind of thing happens to you. Okay. Is that a hard sell? Yes, it's a hard sell. The bad things are happening to me because I am opening up my mouth and talking to the and talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Circumstances would say, okay, ease up, slow down, don't say anything else, keep yourself out of trouble, you don't want any problems. That's what the common consensus would be. Paul Paul and the apostles and never did it. Peter never did it. We find Paul we find, we find Paul and Silas in prison in Acts chapter number 16. They were told not to speak. They went ahead and they did they did what they did anyway, and we see what happened. Here they are in the prison, praising God. Praising God in chains, praising God. And so once again, just because we're told not to speak in the name of Christ does not mean that it's something that we have to comply with. I'm not talking about on the job when you're supposed to be working. I'm talking about outside of, of the job. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before 
you. And so th there you have, there you have the Beatitudes. There you have the, this, these principles that God has given us, and it, he's going to continue uh, with these principles throughout uh, throughout this book, uh, th throughout these uh, next few chapters. But here, those those several blessings, those be attitudes, they set the standard. They set the standard. And verse number six, when you hunger and thirst after his righteousness, when you desire just to be like him, he will fill you. He will fill you once again with our face, with our faith rather properly placed in the finished work of Christ. He will bring this to pass. Amen. Verse number 13. Verse number 13. It says, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. You and I are salt. Salt is a preservative. We are here to keep the world from becoming more corrupt. The world is dark, the world is corrupt. We understand that. But we are a uh, a preserving factor. As long as we are here, the world will not get as bad as it could. As long as we are here. Remember what Jesus said. We went over it just a few minutes ago. Jesus said as long as he is here. He is the light of the world. Now we know his spirit is here. Present in all of us. His, he, he is sovereign. We understand that. But once again now we are. We are the children of light. And we are to bring that light that he had. We are to be that light now. And so as long as we are here, the world will never be as corrupt and dark as it could be. We will find this out. We won't be here, but when the rapture takes place, that will open up the door for the Antichrist to come. What do you think is keeping the Antichrist back now? What do you think is, is keeping back uh, the forces of darkness that would come and bring total chaos into this world? What do you think is stopping that? It is the church. The church. We are we are the preservatives. We are, in a sense, holding these things together. I know God is in control. Nothing. We are nothing without him. But we are that preserving factor. But he says here, if we lose our savor, in other words, if we lose our taste, if we become tasteless, then what are we good for? He says here, we're good for nothing. If salt loses the thing, the flavor that makes it salt, it's not salt anymore. And so we must remain, we must rather retain our saltiness, our effectiveness. We must continue to allow the word of God to work in our lives. Salt can be uh, salt can be illustrative of the word of God. We must continue to allow uh, the word of God to be preeminent in our lives. Once again, if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, the word of God, we must keep that in our hearts and in our lives. Verse number 14, in addition to being the salt of the earth, he says also, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Now, once again, Jesus said that he's the light of the world as long as he is in the world. Uh, in, in John chapter 9 and verse number 5, uh, he says in John 8 and chapter 12, chapter 8 and verse number 12, that he is the light of the world. He is the light of the world. And so he says, because we are that light, we cannot be hidden. He sees the gospel. He sees the kingdom of heaven. He sees it as a great city. We the people of God, we are great city. We cannot hide. We cannot hide. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. In other words, you don't you don't light a lamp and then put it under a basket. What's the point of that? That doesn't work. You, the candle is not being used for what it's for. It's no longer effective if you're going to light it and then hide it. No good. 
he says, and it giveth, uh, and, and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, put it up high, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. It gives light to all that are in the house. Remember that light dispels or takes away darkness. Where there is where there is light, there is no darkness. We'll close out our study tonight in verse number 16. It says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Glorify your Father which is in heaven. And that's so very important. We don't, we don't do what we do so people can see what we do and say, hey, you're a great guy. Wow, I can't believe what, what you're doing is a, such a good thing. That's not why we do what we do. We do what we do because we've been called to do it. And we do what we do because we love him. And in so doing, he says, let our light shine in such a way that it's going to bring glory to God <clears throat> and not to yourself. No. It's not going to bring glory to you. It's not supposed to bring glory to you. You're not supposed to take any glory for yourself. So let our light shine so that um, so that uh, they, the world, may see your good works. In so doing, have a desire to know the God that you serve. And then they will glorify God. That's how that happens. So let's continue to do the work of the Lord, which will cause men to see him, not us. I don't want anybody to see me. I, I'm wrong target. No, I don't want anybody to see me. I want people to see Christ. I said it many times before. If you're, if you're drawn to me, then I must be doing something wrong. I, I don't want you to see me. I know I'm, the, I know that we who do what we do, uh, we are the face of what it is that we do, but our attempt is we are we we desire to draw men to Christ. That's all we're about. We are simply trying to draw men to Christ. Amen. So that's so. That's so so uh, very important. Amen. Let me read here before we close out. <clears throat> Juliana says. Interesting, he says we cannot be hid after he talks about being persecuted. Uh, we cannot hide in fear, not stop sharing the truth. Amen. Amen. We cannot uh, we cannot hide. No, we, we, we cannot hide. Here, if you if you know the book of Acts, and I'm sure you're aware of the book of Acts, uh, we see three or uh, two or three persecutions throughout the book of Acts where something happened and the Christians were put to flight. Herod would rise up or they were told not to not to speak in Jesus name. Anyway, they would they were persecutions and they would go. But wherever they went, they brought the gospel with them. They didn't stop preaching the gospel. Wherever they found themselves, they preached the gospel. And that's so very important. What's that saying? Uh the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. No matter how people over the years have tried to stomp Christianity out, have tried to, to kill it, to try and end it, all they do is to further it. All it does is spread it out further. And so when persecution happens, wherever we're sent, we bring the gospel with us. Amen. That's how it goes. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we bless your name tonight. We thank you once again for giving us this opportunity to bless your name. And Lord, we know, don't know what we would do without you, Lord. We just bless you and we thank you for who you are and for what you have done. Lord, we know that these are lofty principles, Lord. And we know that we cannot attain, we cannot even, we cannot even propose to live out these words unless our faith is firmly placed in your finished work. So, Lord, we pray that you will help us to keep our eyes focused on you, that you might remain the object of our faith as we, Lord, strive to live out this life that you have given us. Lord, bless those who have come around to hear your word here tonight. Bless them and keep them and hold them in the hollow of your hand. 
will be so careful to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. God is good. Amen. Now, when we pick up, when we come together next time, uh, we are going to pick up in verse number 17. Verse number 17, and Christ is going to uh, begin to show us his relationship to the law. Amen. So uh, we look forward to that coming next week. Hope you can join us at that time. Now, at the same time, I'd like to uh, invite you, uh, invite you to join us uh, any day this week, except Thursday and Friday, that is. Uh, we're continuing tomorrow night. Uh, with our series entitled Lighting the Darkness. We're understanding our role as children of light. We were talking about that a little bit tonight, but we're going to uh, speak about it uh, further at length uh, for the next several uh, Tuesday nights, understanding our role as children of light. Amen. So hope you can join us tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. Amen. Wednesday night, we're continuing in our first principles of the Christian life. And we're looking at now, we're looking at the Christian and sin. Amen. We have a couple of more lessons uh, left there. Uh, we're going to continue talking about the Christian's relationship to sin. Amen. So be sure to join us then. Amen. Also, Sunday morning. Sunday morning, we're looking forward to the Strong Tower, our brand new series. Rejoicing in the most powerful name in the universe. And that name is Christ, Jesus Christ, amen, so we look forward to that, join us, we had a blessed time uh, yesterday morning, and uh, we pray that you'll be able to join us this coming Sunday morning, catch us live at 11.30, or you can catch the replay, amen, so God is good, God is good, and we just thank him for what uh, he is doing, amen, now, uh, you can also Become a part of this ministry simply by following us on YouTube, subscribing to our channel, or you can visit our website at that's the word.org. Amen. That's the word.org. Uh, we have sent out uh, our latest uh, our latest newsletter letting you know what's going on here in the ministry. If you have not signed up for our uh, newsletter, uh, please do so, and we will send you out a copy. Amen. There's also a page. There's also a page there where you can uh, go and you can find uh, our latest ebook. Uh, it's a free download entitled uh, Remaining Unmovable, Seven Keys to Quality, Longevity in Christ. Amen. So we pray uh, that you will avail yourself to that free resource. Amen. And if this ministry has been a blessing to you in any way, uh, any way, shape or form, uh, we have placed a donate button there on on our ministry page, um, and it's there if you would uh, like to use it. Amen. Uh, we do what we do uh, by the grace of God, and we are not in this for the money whatsoever. Uh, this ministry is not about money, uh, but I know there are those who uh, who want to give, and so there is that way that you can give if you would choose to do so. Amen. So. That is all we have for tonight. I'm Pastor Michael Jason. I hope that you can join us tomorrow night as we continue uh, with the Bible Speaks Live, Lighting the Darkness. I'm looking forward to it. That's at 8 o'clock p.m. Until then, God bless you, Tonda, Juliana. God bless you, uh, Rosvaline, France, um, Dawn, God bless you, and Kathleen, looking at the names here, Donna, God bless you, God bless you all, God bless you all who are watching live, and God bless you all uh, who will watch on the replay, amen, until then, we'll see you next time, I'm Pastor Michael Jakes, have a great night, God bless you.